Professor Christopher Granger and Professor Lars Valentin uh, to the stage to present the data of the Aristotle trial, efficacy and safety of apixaban compared to warfarin for prevention of stroke and systemic embolism. Uh, thank you, and we're, we're delighted today to be presenting the results of the Aristotle trial. It's actually now online in New England Journal of Medicine, and I'll be presenting the main results later this morning, and, and Lars, the results according to INR control um, this afternoon. And these are my disclosures, and, and I don't get paid to go to the bathroom. Um, by the way. We know that warfarin is, is highly effective for preventing stroke in atrial fibrillation, but it has major limitations that have limited its application and um, that, 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 that have provided an opportunity for the novel agents to provide substantial advances in the care of patients with atrial fibrillation. So we embarked in the Aristotle trial then to address patients with atrial fibrillation who have at least one additional risk factor for stroke defined by the classic CHADS criteria, randomized in a double-blind, double-dummy fashion to receive either a Pixaban, 5 milligrams a day, and 2.5 milligrams a day for patients who were at higher risk of bleeding based on two of three criteria of older age, higher creatinine, low body weight, or warfarin with the target INR of two to three, and to maintain the blind, we used a sham INR or INR approach based on an encrypted point of care testing device for monitoring and adjustment. The primary outcome was stroke or systemic embolism. And the main outcome, the primary outcome of the trial was a 21% relative risk reduction in apixaban versus warfarin for the reduction of stroke or systemic embolism. The, uh, there was 1.27% event rate in the apixaban group, 1.6% in the warfarin group, hazard ratio 0.79, p-value for non-inferiority highly significant, p-value for superiority 0.011. And then more details about the efficacy outcomes show that the rate of stroke itself was reduced by 21%. This was mainly driven by a reduction in hemorrhagic stroke where there was a 49% relative risk reduction and also an 8% relative risk reduction in ischemic or uncertain stroke. All-cause death, which was also part of our pre-specified outcome according to a hierarchical testing procedure to preserve the overall type 1 error of the trial, was also statistically significantly reduced with an 11% relative risk reduction p-value 0.047. When we took stroke, systemic embolism, or all-cause death, that was significantly reduced, 11% um, relative risk reduction. Myocardial infarction was numerically fewer uh, with apixaban with a 12% non-significant relative risk reduction. Another key outcome, and also part of our predefined sequence of analyses, was for safety looking at major bleeding according to the ISTH definition. And here there was a 31% highly statistically significant reduction in major bleeding. Hazard ratio 0.69, p-value less than 0.001, with the curve separating um, almost immediately. With respect to more details on the, on the bleeding, uh, intracranial hemorrhage was reduced by 58%. Gastrointestinal hemorrhage, non-significant 11% relative risk reduction. Major or clinically relevant non-major bleeding reduced by 32%. And then when we looked at more severe categories of bleeding by either the gusto or the TIMI score, the point estimate was for an even greater percent reduction, about a 50% relative risk reduction in these more severe categories of bleeding. And then something very important to patients, any type of bleeding, an aggregate of all bleeding, reduced from 25.8 down to 18.1%, a 29% relative risk reduction. I'll now let Lars um, address the, uh, the issue of time and therapeutic range. 
in this type of studies, the control group is very important. And what are we comparing to? We are comparing to warfarin treatment globally in 40 different countries. And the standards of warfarin treatment <coughs> is very different between different countries. We measure this as time in treatment range and in Northern Europe and in the US. Time in treatment range is in the top and we have looked into centers, median treatment range during the trial, and in these developed higher income countries we have a time in treatment range above 72% of the time. In lower income countries, in India, in Eastern Europe, we have much worse warfarin treatment, usually under dosing, and time in treatment range below 58%. Therefore, it can always be asked, these results, are they relevant to us in Europe? And therefore, we compare the results in relation to quartiles of <coughs> TTR at the different centers. And the results showed quite convincingly that although the event rates were higher if you had poor INR control, we had benefits, continuous benefits with apixaban regardless of INR control. So at poor INR control there was a 23% relative benefit in countries with good INR control, centers with good INR control, 19% benefit. So the results were consistent regardless of INR control. And this goes also for bleeding. Even the bleeding benefits were consistent regardless of INR control. So therefore we can conclude from this trial the treatment with apixaban as compared to warfarin in patients with atrial fibrillation and at least one additional risk factor for stroke reduces stroke and systemic embolism by 21%, reduces major bleeding by 31%, reduces mortality by 11%, and these results are consistent across all major subgroups, across different standards of INR controls with fewer discontinuations of medications than warfarin. And therefore, these results are really consistent with good tolerability. Thank you. Thank you very much for the elegant presentation. Um, you are welcome to ask questions now. Please. Please go to the uh, microphone. The, uh, the INR results are by center, so we looked into the center's average INR control, but that correlates rather closely with countries. And if you come from northern Europe, like Scandinavia, Netherlands, even US, you are in the top quartile. If you come from Eastern Europe, South America, Asia, usually in the lower. But if you, if you break it up just by INR control, you have the same results by country as we show you by center. No, but I'm, I'm saying forgetting country or center just by INR control. In other words, those who had the, the, the longest time in the uh, therapeutic range and those in the lowest. Yeah. We, uh, I mean, we have no INRs in the pixaban treated patients, so therefore we need to stratify it by center's INR control. And if you do that, you find that regardless of INR control, you have <coughs> the advantage. Okay. Next question. Um, perhaps both of you can address, I realize that the uh, study that you're presenting uh, didn't look specifically at a comparison with some of the other new antithrombotic agents that are coming along or on the market, but um, with these results, could you give any kind of characterization about how apixaban might compare to dabigatran and rivaroxaban? Uh, it's a tough question, of course. I, I think we, uh, at this press conference we should emphasize the results with apixaban. I think what's uh, very impressive with apixaban, it is that it has a stroke reduction and it has a very impressive safety. So we have a reduction in bleeding, we have a better tolerability, patient stays longer on warfarin, 
There is also another trial, the Averroes trial, comparing to aspirin, showing that apixaban has the same tolerability as low-dose aspirin, and the patient stays even longer on apixaban than aspirin. So I, I think, therefore, if there are advantages with one compound against the other, apixaban has a very impressive safety. There are no in increases in gastrointestinal bleeding with apixaban. There is no signal in relation to myocardial infarction. So overall, the safety profile is very impressive. Yeah. We have a question here in the front. Maybe if I could just add, I, I, I do think this is good news for patients with atrial fibrillation, not just the Aristotle trial, but, but the, the four trials that have been conducted so far, that all of these trials are showing now we have treatments that are at least as good as warfarin and that have substantially lower rates of, of especially the most serious type of bleeding of intracranial hemorrhage and, and hemorrhagic stroke. And then as, as, as Lars has pointed out, the particular, the most exciting aspects we believe of the Aristotle trial is that we have this, we've, we think we've hit the sweet spot in terms of the dose, that we've got this, that we've got these results where there is this 21 percent reduction in total stroke at the same time, a 31 percent reduction in major bleeding, that that's really good news. I'm sorry, could I ask another question, please? Here it's another question in the front first. Please, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, it's often said, uh, Asian English Japanese has a higher risk of bleeding than Caucasian and Africans, so are there any difference between race and sex? Please comment on that. Uh, yeah, yeah. There, is, there, there are no gender differences. Uh, we, have, we are presenting all the different subgroups in the New England Journal of Medicine and at today's presentation. And the results, if anything, look rather better in females than in males. Yeah, yeah. Maybe one other comment about Japan in specifically. Um, one of the things that we did that's a bit unusual in these global programs is Japan was actually part of the core Aristotle trial, which, which again is a bit unusual. And we, we think that's a good thing, to have Japan not have to have a separate set of trials with, with for example, separate INR control levels for Japan than other areas of the world. And, and as Lars pointed out, we see, we've actually seen remarkable consistency of both the efficacy and the safety results according to subgroups, including geographic region and, or um, uh, well, geographic region. Um, so uh, a question particularly for you, Dr. Granger. Um, in the U.S., uh, Dabigatran has been on the market now for almost a year, and I was wondering if you could characterize the uptake that it's had for the atrial fibrillation population in the U.S., uh, what you see as some of the dynamics that may have contributed to that, and what it might portend for what's going to happen with something like uh, apixaban. Yeah, I, as Lars pointed out, I think we really don't want to comment on other drugs and other agents, other than to say that that, that I do believe, not surprisingly, that the clinical community is enthusiastic about having replacements for warfarin. Yes, please. Are there no GFR-related issues? Oh, thank you. Are there no GFR-related issues with this medication? Uh, the renal elimination is 25 percent, so, uh, so therefore there is a larger therapeutic ratio for even renal dysfunction patients with this agent. We reduced the dose in patients at low body weight and reduced renal function, and therefore the results in patients with a low dose, reduced renal function, are at least as good concerning stroke reduction and bleeding as in patients with normal renal function. Of course, those with worse renal function were excluded from the trial, but it seems that there is less of a renal issue with this compound than some of the previous ones. And what was your cutoff for your GFR for exclusion from the trial, do you recall? It was 20. 20. 20, I, I think actually 25. 25. Um, yeah. Okay. greater than 2.5. And the age, of the inclusion criteria for the age for this trial was? Yeah, over 18, okay. or at least 18, no oh. upper limit. Okay, next uh, question, please. The oldest patient was really, really 97 years. <laughs> uh, next question. Chris and Lars, beautiful result, very carefully conducted study. And I think you're wise at handling the questions about the other drugs. But one thing that was curious that struck me, and we saw this in the analysis Lars did in Rely, is when you look at the TTR INR control, surely in the warfarin group, as the TTR gets better, the event rates goes down, and that's plausible. 
But when you look at the apixaban group, you see the same trend. Any thoughts why that is so? That's suggesting that the people with the bad TTR are inherently sicker than the people with the good TTR. Any thoughts? I'm sure you yeah, I, analyzed I, it carefully. Uh, there, are, there are lots of analyses ongoing to understand this, that we overall have lower event rates in centers with better INR control. But this is partly related to that these are definitely different countries. They have different baseline characteristics, patients that are included in higher income than lower income countries. And as you have shown this morning, there are different treatments in other respects between high and low income countries. So therefore, we have many other factors influencing the event rates between the different countries. But I think what we really have compared is then the results of Apixaban versus Warfarin in these settings. And Apixaban was advantageous regardless of uh, the income level of the country, regardless of uh, the underlying treatment, as it seems. And we are now working, of course, more in this area to understand these relationships. Oh, the very last question, please, yes. Hi, I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on why this agent didn't increase GI bleeding when the other two agents did? Uh, again, um, uh, a little difficult to do these types of comparisons. There are specific agents, as you may know, with, with dibigatran with respect to the need for an acid environment and the tartaric acid in the capsule, which, which I suppose might relate to some issues, specific issues with dibigatran. And with apixaban, um, what I think it's not surprising to see a lower rate of GI bleeding because we see this consistent, substantial rate reduction in major bleeding. And this is, this is a, a distinguishing um, feature, I think, it, um, of, of our results, that, uh, that we do see um, that, uh, that there's a consistent reduction in the various types of bleeding. But rivaroxaban is the same type of um, agent, so... Yeah, and rivaroxaban didn't increase major bleeding as an, as an overall category. The, again, the most important types of bleeding all of these drugs reduce. That's intracranial hemorrhage, hemorrhagic stroke. But beyond that, um, the low-dose dibigatran reduced bleeding by about 20 percent, and uh, apixaban reduced bleeding by 31 percent in, um, in the Aristotle trial, which was, uh, again, consistent across various types of bleeding. If I might add a final comment, it is that when you start the patient on a prophylactic treatment, the patient has no symptoms. What you like to avoid as a physician, as a patient, it is to create damage. Don't harm. It is the first rule of a physician. So therefore, to have a very safe agent when you start prophylactic treatment is extremely important. Okay, thank you very much for the nice presentation. Uh, we would like to proceed.